it is November 5th, 2009 at the Fort Hood facility in Fort Hood, Texas. This army base is one of the most prominent army bases in the United States, one that many different soldiers are stationed at. Though this day would go down in infamy. It is a little bit afternoon at the soldier readiness facility where soldiers are brought in and given medical screening before they are shipped overseas to defend our country. They're coming in to defend their nation from threats from abroad, but have no idea that there is a threat right around them that is ready to take their life. For this week's video, we are gonna be telling the story about the 2009 Fort Hood shooting. What happened here yesterday happened fast. On an ordinary November afternoon, the post became a combat zone. As soldiers preparing to head to war gathered for their final medical exams, their last minute paperwork before heading overseas, one of their own walked in and opened fire. Major Nadel Hassan, a United States Army major and psychiatrist, came into the office where he worked, getting ready to deploy to Afghanistan in just a few short days. But on this day, he came in armed with an FN 5.7 semi-automatic handgun and a 357 revolver. You may ask, why would a army major commit what ended up being the largest terrorist attack on any US base on US soil? Well, for that, we are going to look into his past with eyes unclouded and see how exactly a United States Army Major ended up killing 13 people, one of which was a pregnant soldier and injuring 30 others on what is supposed to be one of the most secure areas in the United States and United States Army military base. Nadal Hassam had always been a sort of an outcast. Even when he was attending medical school at the Walter Reed Medical Facility, he was reprimanded several times for doing inappropriate behavior. He was always thought of as someone to have sort of extremist views, always saying how he was against any type of battle in the Middle East, how America being over there was a villain, even though he himself was preparing to join the military so that he could go overseas. Even though there were several reports brought up against him, as well as one where he was actually said to have said threatening things to other medical students, those reports were just kind of pushed under the rug and he was eventually graduated with his medical degree and went on to work as a psychiatrist at Fort Hood. His job was to perform psychiatric exams on soldiers coming to and coming from combat. People believe that was one of the big parts that radicalized him because Upon the soldiers coming back, he would hear about all of the terrible things that they did overseas, many of which he considered wrong due to his faith. We're not sure what exactly it was that pushed him over the edge. Perhaps it was the fact that he soon was going to be going overseas to fight against who he considered his own people. So Nadal Hassam prepared his arms and came in that November afternoon, a little bit after one, and he opened fire. He came into the building armed with his FN 5.7 with laser sights, asked to see one of the other majors there in the building, and then he jumped up behind one of the counters 
shout it out in Arabic, God is great, Allah Akbar. And he began opening fire. He was shooting what many thought was indiscriminately, but there was one thing that people there noticed. He had the opportunity to shoot civilians that were there in that facility as well, but passed up them instead targeting soldiers, people in uniforms. He... He did not stop shooting. It is believed that he shot over 200 rounds from this handgun, killing 13, again one of which was a female soldier that was pregnant with an unborn child and injured 30 others. This began at 1.37 p.m. on November 5th, 2009. It was an exceptional scene. It was a terrible, terrible thing, but let me tell you something. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Been up for 48 hours, guys, I'm sorry. These soldiers are America's best example of how, what, how we go about doing things right in this country. Now you may ask, why was it that soldiers didn't return fire? That is because military bases are in effectively gun-free zones. Soldiers are not allowed to carry firearms unless it's during training or if they're military police, and there are no military police on scene that day. Though the gunman himself did not go against a helpless crowd. He was attacked by several of the soldiers using anything from chairs to their own bodies as weapons. However, none of them were able to stop him and he gunned down every single person that stood in his way. Specialist Kira Bona was there too. She saw Hassan shooting and was hit in the back and the top of her head. The man jumped, stood up and he said, Allah Akma or something of that sort. And he started firing, and I think, I'm sure one of the first couple shots he fired off is what grazed the top of my head. Now, base civilian sergeant Kimberly Moonley was the first armed first responder on scene. She met Hassan outside of the building and exchanged gunfire with him. At first, she was hit by a piece of shrapnel from a ricochet round that hit a nearby grate. It tore through her hand. Though sadly, that was not the only shot that she received. He fired on her more times, several rounds going through her leg and one actually fracturing her pelvis. Hassan walked up to her, kicked the gun away, and then left her there. After all, he was only after soldiers and she was but a civilian police officer. He continued opening fire on soldiers in the area that were trying to flee away while soldiers inside of the facility barricaded the door shut keeping him from coming in to finish what he started. At this time with the building secured nurses and medics filled themselves into the building trying to treat all of those that were wounded. Nurses arriving on scene gave first-hand accounts that there was so much blood covering the floors that they had trouble walking in there without slipping to get to those that were injured. Now here, I'm going to show a scene recorded by one of those first responders. I do ask that you show discretion because these are very graphic images, but it's important that we see exactly what happened so that we understand just what these soldiers and those that risked their lives to help their brothers and sisters in danger had to face. In the three years since, the attack at Fort Hood in Texas has been forgotten by many, but not by the victims. The people in the Army processing room that day who say they have been forgotten and neglected too. 
This is what they experienced, terror and chaos that has not been seen publicly until tonight in new footage obtained by ABC News, taken moments after the carnage ended. It wasn't soon afterwards that Police Sergeant Mark Todd arrived on the scene and two began trading gunfire with Hassam. As Hassam went to reload, Todd opened fire striking Hassam five times, one of the rounds actually severing his spinal column, which led to Hassam being paralyzed from this day forward. Sergeant Todd approached him, kicked the gun out of reach, and put him in handcuffs. The threat was neutralized for now, but the aftermath was nowhere near being cleaned up. There laid 13 dead and over 30 wounded, many of the wounded in critical condition. In the aftermath, 146 rounds were fired by Hassam inside of the building. 68 more rounds were picked up outside, a combination of those that he fired and those that were fired by receiving officers, meaning in a total of 214 rounds fired. That is a lot of ammunition, but the truth is, is that it could have been a whole lot worse. The medics that began treating Hassam found that his pockets were filled with magazines. In fact, he carried on him 177 more rounds, loaded in 20 and 30 round magazines. He was prepared to take a whole lot more lives and would have if it wasn't for him being stopped so quickly by Sergeant Todd. In the aftermath, there were 13 dead, 12 soldiers and one civilian. 11 of those died on the scene, two more died in the hospital soon after. It also left 30 wounded and was the worst terrorist attack on a United States military base in U.S. history. For 13 families across the country, the families of Hassan's victims, what he did in those few minutes will never be truly over. Among the dead, 21-year-old Francesca Velez, just back from Iraq, on her way home to Chicago because she was pregnant. She was just a great person, and it's, it's very sad that her life was taken away from her. Issue is, is that it was not considered a terrorist attack. The United States government claimed it to be a war, an incident of, believe it or not, workplace hostility. Now you may ask, why is there such a big deal about President Barack Obama labeling it as a place of workplace hostility instead of an act of terror? The issue with that is that none of those soldiers that were injured received any type of military benefits of those that were injured in combat. Instead, it was considered just workplace violence. There were multiple people wounded everywhere that soldiers were treating. Um, uh, if it wasn't for those soldiers that came over, even with the thought of someone still shooting and stuff like that, to treat these people, to come out of other buildings and treat, there would have been a lot more losses today. They saved countless lives yesterday by what they did. Now, many of the responding soldiers and those that were there felt they were treated wrongly by their government from this. Due to the fact that it was once again labeled as a workplace violence, they received no benefits and the families of those that were killed did not receive the same kind of respect, treatment, or benefits as those of a soldier who would be killed in action overseas. 13 people killed, including a pregnant soldier, and 32 shot, none of whom received the Purple Heart or any of the additional veterans medical and financial benefits given those wounded or killed in war because the military, to the outrage of the victims, has apparently deemed this workplace violence. President Obama refused to label this as a terrorist attack. And family members of those affected, as well as one of the police sergeants, actually performed a lawsuit against 
the United States government, and Hassan himself. At the heart of what has outraged Munley and other Fort Hood victims and led them to file this lawsuit is the military's decision not to award Purple Hearts and its insistence on calling the shooting workplace violence. Despite Major Hassan's documented communications with Al-Qaeda leader Anwar al-Awlaki, who has since been killed in a U.S. drone strike. Eventually, Hassan refused to have lawyers and instead decided to represent himself, meaning that he could walk up and talk with the victims that were being used as witnesses, interjecting what they had to say. There was another issue. While he was facing court-martial, he was still considered a soldier in the military and in turn was receiving pay as well as regulation required raises for a certain amount of time in service. By the time the court-martial was finished, he had been paid almost $300,000 worth of salary. So when he told you, we're going to take care of you, that did not turn out to be true? No. What would you say to the president? If I were to see him again, um, again, it's not about me, but I would just beg him to please take care of It wasn't until 2015 where it was officially labeled as a terrorist attack and those families received respect and all of the benefits that they deserved. After a lengthy trial, Hassam was convicted and sentenced to death. He is currently at Fort Leavenworth Prison awaiting his execution. There is no time set for when it will be executed and it is likely that it is going to be years and years until the date is actually set due to the fact of the rigorous appeals he is going through to go against his ruling. He claimed himself as a martyr and said that he wanted the death penalty so that way he could be a martyr to the Islamic extremists that he hoped to inspire overseas. That Nadal Hassan would never become a martyr because he has nothing to give. He is a criminal, a cold-blooded murderer. He is not giving his life. We are taking his life. The name of all of those that were killed was civilian ph physician Michael Grant Cahill who was shot trying to charge the shooter. Major Libardo Caviero, age 52. Staff Sergeant Justin DeCrow. Captain John Gaffney, who also died trying to charge the shooter. Specialist Frederick Green of Mountain City, Tennessee, who also tried to charge the shooter. Specialist Jason Hunt, who was shot in the back. Staff Sergeant Amy Kruger, who was shot in the chest. Private First Class Aaron Namika, shot in the chest. Private First Class Michael Pearson, who was shot in the chest. Captain Russell Seeger. Private First Class Francesca Velas, who was eight months pregnant when she was shot, and her child also died as a result of her injuries. Lieutenant Colonel Juanita Warman and Private First Class Kam Ziong from Minnesota who was originally from Thailand. These were all of those that were killed during this horrible, horrible terrorist attack. This brings an end to this video Make sure you like and subscribe. Comment below what you think I should do for the next video. Make sure to join our Discord so that you can get early access to all of the Damn Guide videos. If you want to support, please donate 
join the Patreon or get merchandise. We have our new merchandise line out. From your friend, the damn God, I wish you all a happy morning, afternoon, evening, and night. From your friend, the damn God, I'll see you next time. Bye now.